Our next guest is Julie Shaw. She is a professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT and she also leads the interactive robotics group of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, short CSAIL. Julie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you so much for having me. So please get us started. What is a robot? I think a lot of us have an image in our mind to how we think a robot sounds like, maybe looks like, but what does it actually mean? Uh, what is a robot and what different areas of use um, are interesting to employ a robot? I mean, there are industrial fields on the one hand and then maybe the health and the care sector uh, and field on the other hand? Yeah, this is this is a great question. So um, the, I th the first thing to um, realize is that when we talk about a robot, we're not necessarily talking about a smart robot. So the definition of a robot is a system with three or sometimes people say four degrees of freedom, meaning kind of three or four joints to you know, for articulated movement. Um, but that doesn't make it a smart or an intelligent robot. So, you know, any system with those, um, those number of degrees of freedom can, you know, manipulate or, you know, move around, but just in a very repetitive fashion. Uh, I think what's really exciting about what we're seeing today is the increasing use of uh, intelligent robots. And in, in particular, I'm, I'm, I'm in my own research, I'm excited about collaborative robots. And these are robots that are not just, you know, safe enough to um, you know, work near people, but also are smart enough to be something that resembles more of a teammate, uh, a system that we can, in the ideal, work with as easily and naturally as we can work with other people. Yeah, so you already touched on it. What makes a good human team member and uh, how does that maybe also count for robot uh, team members? Um, that's how you put it once uh, in a conversation you and I had when I went to visit you at MIT. The, the key aspects that make humans such effective teammates to other humans is our ability to infer what our partner is thinking, our ability to anticipate what our partner will do next, and then our ability to use that information as a, as a part of our own planning to make changes as circumstances unfold or as disruptions occur. And um, the, in, in my research, I'm really excited about giving robots those capabilities, the ability to infer human cognitive state, to anticipate what we'll do both sort of physically, like how we, we might move in doing a task, but also cognitively or mentally um, anticipate our priorities, our preferences and our needs and then give the robot the ability to use that online to play the game with us in a very dynamic fashion. So obviously one part of your work is to test these robots, to see them in action. And at least pre-pandemic, uh, you used to have people come inside of the laboratory and work with the robots. Uh, what could you observe? How was that kind of cooperation and collaboration, uh, especially when it comes to humans who maybe are not um, that um, used to working with robots? You know, on first introduction, you know, uh, people will approach the robot very differently. They might bring sort of very different assumptions about what the robot can do. Um, but, but we as people are enormously adaptable. We very, very quickly adapt to, um, uh, to a robot, I mean, to the, like, in terms of capability, but it also in terms of just sort of social interaction, you know, it's not uncommon for someone to come in and work with one of our very standard, you know, like rigid looking industrial robots, the type of thing you see in a factory and hug it at the end of an experiment because, uh, you know, they have a sense that it understood them because it was anticipating what they would do and, and being helpful to them. And when we look into the field where robots can help us, with uh, daily tasks, with uh, getting dressed, for example, or with uh, combing our hair. Um, I imagine that there might be different challenges uh, compared to a industrial robot that might uh, do some heavy lifting in building a car. Um, so what are the unique challenges uh, when it comes to a robot in the care field? I, so I like to joke that, you know, good teamwork is good teamwork, whether it's on the International Space Station or, you know, in a cockpit or collaborating together to cook mm -hmm. something in the kitchen or even, you know, helping in a very intimate fashion, say um, someone someone get dressed. 
But there's many other tasks that do require kind of close physical manipulation. They require contact. And there you need a different definition of safety. You need you know, the robot to slow and stop, but, but be allowed to make contact as long as it doesn't make contact in a way that harms the person or is detrimental to the task. So hearing how wonderful and helpful these robots can actually be, how almost human-like, I would like to take the chance and talk about Abby. Um, can you explain us a little bit about um, who Abby is? Uh, Abby was one of our first robots that we used uh, right when I started on the faculty and was building up the robotics lab about 10 to 11 years ago now. And you can imagine in your mind, Abby is a small but very standard kind of orange industrial robot. Uh, very not safe. <laughs> All it can do is, you know, you, you can control it by position, but it doesn't see you. It's blind to you. It can move so fast. It's sort of a blur and it can really, really hurt you. It's a dangerous robot. Um, it's not typically a type of robot that you would put a person to work next to. Um, and so, you know, the first, um, you know, the first step there was to make Abby safe enough to work alongside people. So um, to ensure that Abby could see a person, we put Uh, a motion capture suit on the person with kind of little lights and cameras so we would know exactly where the person was in the space. And then we could slow and stop Abby as the person neared. So we could ensure safety through very, very careful engineering. Um, the, uh, now the challenge with you know, just ensuring safety is that you can be a safe collaborator, but very inefficient and like very practically what happens in industrial settings when you deploy these systems that you just want to be safe is the robot is slowed and stopped so much <laughs> because it can't because it can't predict what a person's going to do a person is the ultimate uncontrollable entity the robot you the robot just you know it's called the freeze it's a, there's a name for it we call it the freezing robot problem <laughs> and it just destroys <laughs> the case for introducing this robot and to work interdependently with the person um Now the challenge is, then you think, well, what do you do next? Well, you don't want to trade safety for efficiency or for productivity. Like, how do you make that trade? Um, but there are many other environments in which we don't make that trade. Think of our air transportation system. We don't think, how do we trade safety of uh, you know, multiple aircraft coming into a landing at an airport for the efficiency of getting more aircraft to land? No, we look for the ways in which we can deploy technology to maintain safety and increase efficiency. And, um, and that's what we did. So we were able to show that you know, by giving Abby these models of how a human would behave, Uh, Abby could maintain even greater safety, larger separation distance between the robot and the person. But while anticipating where the person is, Abby could intelligently maneuver around them so that the two could complete their tasks even more efficiently. Um, so, we, you know, fast forward, you know, 10 years, we, we just recently retired Abby. Abby is in the corner and we refer to her fondly. But now we have <laughs> um, new robots in the lab, this new breed of collaborative robot, which is uh, much, much safer to work with. Um, but we still have the same challenge. Wh wherever you are is your standard in terms of safety. How do you increase efficiency? How do you increase productivity? How do you make these robots smart enough And so that a person can work flexibly with them and not have to become a robot to work with a robot. Um, and that's where we uh, focus our, our innovations. So I think hearing the term dangerous robot or not cooperative um, kind of ring a bell for a lot of people. There are obviously a lot of critics when it comes to robotics and AI. So what do you say, for example, to Elon Musk, who's a very, very... Um, cautious of AI and is constantly warning us of machines and of artificial intelligence. There are, there are many points of concern. There's, a, there's many reasons to be concerned as, um, you know, as we develop uh, and feel these technologies. Um, from, you know, from my own point of view, I, I have spent a lot of time uh, thinking deeply about what are the inherent strengths and limitations of what humans and machines bring to various types of, of problems. And um, as humans, we do have capabilities that machines are going to take a long, long while to catch up to. But, you know, obviously machines, computers, robots, they have strengths too. The question is, how do you harness these relative strengths? Um, when, when we look at our human ability, so our innate human ability that is not going to be replicable for, for the you know, foreseeable future, is our human ability to structure an unstructured problem. 
Once we've structured a problem, a machine can crush it, like even literally. <laughs> um, but we sometimes underestimate all of the ways that we structure problems for machines, even, even to the point of, you know, um, uh, deep learning, machine learning, providing labels is a way of structuring the world for, for machines. Um, so, you know, uh, we will always have natural strengths. So the question is, how do we harness them? Uh, but there are, there are many, many other reasons to be concerned, even if we're not going to be wholesale replaced in every possible way. And um, you know, even, even up to a few years ago, there was very, very widespread concern about the increasing role of robotics and automation and its potential for displacing um, human work. And, um, uh, and, and MIT delved deeply into this problem. Um, I was involved in a task force convened by our president um, that brought together technologists, engineers, as well as social scientists to really study the current um, situation. And um, you know, if you zoom out at a macro level, you know, there um, the you know increasing use of these technologies, um, you know, uh, has you know uh, has the potential to um, displace work, but doesn't really contribute or has not yet contributed to shared prosperity. When you zoom in, what you realize are there are examples where robotics or automation, intelligent systems, they do supplant human work. But there are other examples where they create work and they augment work. And there are actually many decision points we have, both in developing and shaping this technology, as well as organizational decisions that we make in the introduction of new technologies. And there's uh, you know, a very critical role that, that, that policy plays as well. Uh, we do know there are many decision points, and we have a lot of opportunity to shape this future, both myself as a technologist and, and envision, envisioning the role that technology can play in augmenting rather than replacing. Uh, but also in co-designing the technology with um, sort of the organizational considerations for its implementation. Um, so this is this is not a case where we develop technology and we just have to watch what happens and then address the impacts. This is a case where there's a lot in our control, but also a lot we're still learning about um, how we navigate these sort of controllable points to achieve um, you know, the positive outcomes on many different dimensions. Um, I'm a strong believer in th this is not about trading. This is not about satisficing or sacrificing on one dimension for another. But if we, if we, if we come together, and this requires more than technologists, um, technologists, social scientists, as well as you know, broader, um, broader communities and individuals impacted by these technologies, um, uh, there's a lot, a lot that we can do to make a better future. Uh, since this is the Women's Summit, um, maybe we can talk a little bit who's uh, behind robots and science. Uh, for example, you and your students, colleagues. Um, I assume for something as life-changing as AI, uh, it's very important to have everyone on the field. So all nationalities, all genders, all uh, races. Um, how does it look like at the moment and uh, how do you experience diversity in, uh, in this field? How important is that? I, you know, I, I, I tell my students when they join the lab that robotics is a team sport. There's, you know, very few robotics, you know, advancements that are really done by, by a single person. It really requires working across teams, bringing different disciplines together in, in engineering um, and in, uh, in shaping technologies for positive outcomes. It requires even, you know, a broader set of disciplines, including um, the social sciences. Um, but um, you know, to, to your point, um, when we develop technology, uh, we bring to it our values. We, you know, technology in inherently has values kind of baked into it. So, you know, I bring, uh, I, I bring the desire to envision and shape technology that can enhance rather than replace um, human work. Um, uh, and the, uh, you know, it's it's very very important that we have a diverse um, a diverse group involved in the creation of technology, um, and involved in the discussion of what technologies we want implemented and how they can be implemented in a way that um, ensures fair and equitable uh, outcomes. And um, it's not something much like ro like developing a robot is not something that can be done quietly at my desk just by me. Like getting this right is not something that can be done. Um, just by you know any any uh, group of um, you know small group of uh, people trying to 
uh, do this right. It really requires the very hard work of communication and collaboration uh, and reaching beyond the boundaries of necessarily you know, your, your, the, the well-defined you know, boundaries of a, of a discipline or an expertise. A uh, very powerful way we have for shaping the future is bringing uh, a diverse set of voices and experiences into, um, into the, the creation step of the technology. Um, and I know, you know, I, I, I work very hard to model that in my own lab, bringing in a very international and, and diverse group of people together. Uh, but there's always more we can do and there's always more we, we need this to be to be modeled for it to be something that, you know, uh, that we see uh, in, in, in a much broader way across society. And last but not least, maybe do you have a remark for us or any kind of advice for a young woman who would like to work in the field you're working in? So I guess, you know, um, I, uh, I absolutely love my job. But I did not find this job because I saw this job, <laughs> you know, 10 or even, you know, maybe 10 years ago when I was applying, but even then I wasn't super sure, or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But every step along the way, um, when I had a decision to make, I took the next step that I felt really passionate about, a place where uh, I thought I might be able to bring a unique contribution. And when you move, when you take a step where you think you might be able to bring a unique contribution, sometimes the contribution you're bringing, it's unique because you're very different <laughs> than what's there, what's there before. And that can also feel hard and kind of feel like a leap. Um, and I felt that many times um, in my career and have never regretted um, making a decision with that as the, uh, the motivating reason behind it. And I think, I, you know, uh, don't, don't be afraid to um, follow your passion and your vision and for, uh, for the opportunity for you to make a unique contribution. Thank you so much for taking the time again, Julie. Thank you so much for having me.